upon a time, people in the country, and all these guys didn't even know. And then he had to eat a crackle cheese so much, they don't get ready. They said, Aunt Mama, why they do that? Because this is a new one, tell me they don't get ready. I want to read the tradition. Everybody would be here and say, hi, y'all. That's not everybody's language. But good afternoon. I guess it ain't y'all language either. Que pasa, como esta? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You would think at a Carolina's Resilience Conference as soon as you say hi, y'all, you would have got to be Or hey. But now that's the thing. That was a prime example of what's been going on with the language of what's been happening in the world. Everybody doesn't speak the same language. And I'm a computer scientist. A mathematician, so I can really tell you that if we started speaking and writing the language we're speaking, most of y'all would leave out of this session right now. Because <laughs> you go, like, why are there letters and numbers together? What are they doing? Okay? But the same, but come on in the circle. Come on in, sir. Come on up. So, plenty of times people say, well, I'm coming into your community to work with you. But can we really work together if we can't communicate? Ladies, how many of you have ever dated a man in your life? Raise your hand. <laughs> have you ever had a communication problem? Raise your hand. <laughs> she said, no, OK, that's good for you. <laughs> she, she's like Larry Graham, one in a million. <laughs> Men, have any of you ever dated a woman? Raise your hand. Have you ever had a communication problem with a woman? He kept his hand up. <laughs> the other ones must be your girls and friends or wives are here, you're afraid. I understand. <laughs> we won't tweet and tell her. Uh, so if you're having a communication problem, the relationship gets strained, right? And sometimes the relationship gets stormy. And just like I said in God, when storms come in, they sweep out with a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> and then they leave something missing. Leave a hole there, a gap there. Something's no longer there. The same way you leave a hole in somebody's spirit, if you come over here, ask the person, well, how you doing? <laughs> but this is what you're doing at the same time. Now, what if she was trying to tell me, not feeling good. I mean, I know it, all right? Because I already left. So that's the same way our relationships are nowadays. Especially people who claim to work in communities. But if they work in them, but they're not from the community, a lot of times they do the perfunctory exercise of what the job sent them to do. And they sweep in and they try to grab whatever they can as quick as they can, like they are the latest Hurricane Cat 5, and then go on about their business. There's a few that come, like some of the storms, take their time. Take their time getting there. And so, so from the community, start seeing them. And they start telling them, there's something coming. I don't know what it is, but it ain't from here, because the way it's moving. But it's coming. Well, God, dog, how long it been since it been coming? I days, because I keep seeing it easing in. And then sometimes somebody in the community will get to them and go, hold it. Who are you? You ain't from these parts, are you? Where you from? What you doing? So it kind of stalls there for a little while. And that could be good or that could be bad. Because again, if this is only a perfunctory exercise, this is not my life, maybe there's one person that connects to me, stops me here, and now I think that person and the two other houses on either side of their porch is all I need to talk to. I don't need to come over there and talk to them people. I don't need to know what they think on this topic or nothing else, because if I get enough information right here, I can go on back or move it on up 
the show or somewhere else. Then there's those that stall a little while, but something finally pushes them. And they get pushed and then they keep moving. They might move a little quicker for a minute and then all of a sudden again, they stay there. But what if who's staying there is the negative Nelly? Anybody ever met her besides me? And negative Nelly just showed up to tell you how bad things are going to be. Y'all know, right? Y'all know it's getting bad. It is really a bad thing what is happening in the world right now. Do you y'all realize there's catastrophe upon us right now in the world? It's about to happen. It's about to go down. And they don't mean it like it's a nightclub. They just mean doom, gloom, the whole world. They are, remember the story? The sky is falling. The sky is falling. Right? So now people are like, Then <laughs> they're hidden here. They can't really see all of what's going on. But they wait. And they wait. And they wait. And they wait. The sky's still up there. This person told me last week the sky was falling. And you don't been under there starving yourself to death for a week. Because this person shot your nerves because they brought all this negative energy into the community. Because maybe their culture is one of panic and not progress. Maybe them as an individual, they're not solution oriented. They're the problem bringer, not the problem solver. So how do you navigate between you and can y'all turn your cell phones on? Between you and this individual that swept into your community right now. And God forbid that they got here and they hung around. Right? And they just hung around. Right? Y'all glad when they left. Right? <laughs> so, I show that to you to say, when Gullah Geechee's hear these words, stone, global warming, climate change, sea level rise, we're sitting there going, what is this that's coming into the community? And what does it mean? And how long is it going to be here? Because please take that back across that bridge that brought you, because we don't want to hear that foolish stuff. Y'all ain't going to be here. Why are we going to be here? We've been here since 1600, before there was a weather tent. That's what I was telling you earlier. There was nothing to warn you of a storm in the 16th, 17th, 1800s, and the early 1900s. Nothing. So how is it that we're not going to be here? People are still there. So they found a way to survive, found a way to thrive, found a way to bounce back, is what we used to say. But y'all use this word here for bounce back. What's that one? <laughs> Resilience. Right? Ain't that the word y'all use a bit? Okay, I thought I looked y'all up. Let me go. Since y'all want to show. I know your language too. I ain't gonna put strong down like that shit because y'all ain't all sand tones off. Okay. Here we go. I went and looked this word up. But also looked up another word first. Because just like we first heard global warming, we said, okay, so what that means is just gonna get hot. It's already 90 to 100 degrees on most sea islands every summertime. You mean to tell me it'll be hotter than that? That's what Gullah Geechee's thought. Next thing we heard, climate change. We're like, yeah, the climate change all throughout the year. Every day the climate may change. What you talking about? You got four seasons because then the climate changes. It adapts. That's your other word, right? <laughs> to the season. So we wonder, what is it? why is this news? Didn't make sense to us. Next thing they said, the sea level, their sea level rise, we said, really? Yeah, two times a day. <laughs> the tide is, what do you mean the sea level rise? We know that, two times a day. So we were like, what are these people studying? They need to study this stuff? <laughs> we know this. What is wrong with them? Okay. So we weren't communicating. And the people started coming into the community. We were fine when we could see it on TV. 
Then it started coming in. I'm like, no, 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 no. So I'm like, what is it? So people start hiding from folks. Them university people outside, oh no. <laughs> it's some kind of science people, no, no. Because they were those negative Nellies telling us, y'all gonna have to go, because what you people gonna do? You ain't gonna be able to live here. Why we ain't gonna be able to live here? We lived there 400 years already. But y'all, see y'all not understanding science. I don't understand science, I have a degree in it. What? Yeah, come on. <laughs> what do you mean? What for the numbers? I said, and also as a mathematician, I can tell you the numbers can be skewed to represent whatever you'd like it to represent, really, if somebody's paying you to make the report. Pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to be here. We'd have been here, we'd have been and we'd have talked on. Really? Yeah, really. And maybe if y'all didn't build the way we told you not to build in the past, y'all wouldn't be concerned about not being here either. <laughs> But at the time that we said to the planners, do not allow people to build directly into the shorelines because it's not sustainable. They said we were emotional niggas. That's a quote. Don't care what scientific documentation I'm brought in, the fact that I studied engineering even at Virginia Tech, none of that matters. You all are emotional natives and we're not listening. And those are the same properties that now they're trying to figure out how to make them adaptable so that they can be resilient enough for what? Not for us, but for the tourists to stay in. <coughs> so once again, we don't even want to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> because here they're planning for, with failed plans and for a failing future instead of ones that will adapt and be resilient. So, so maybe I don't understand their definition of the word adapt. The words adapt and the word resilient don't exist in God. They don't exist. But numerous socio-anthropologists and now even geographers have come in and said the Gullah Geechee people are the most resilient people I've ever met. They're the epitome of resilience. How did they do this? And we like just live. You become in harmony with it, and you live in balance with it. But that's not scientific enough, so. So legislators, policy makers can't comprehend, well, how do I write a bill that says that? Let us write it. <laughs> we can write it. Well, first, let's see if we are using the same language, because adaptation was defined on the computer. You know, I went looked that up real quick. Use this little thing y'all called Google right there right quick. And they said, a change or process of change by which an organism or species becomes better suited to its environment. So I said, ooh, a species. I guess Gullah Geechee are now a species. Because we sure are being studied like that. Because people want to know, how did we become so suited for the sea island environment and what you call a low country and northeastern Florida that no matter what happens, we'll still live. How did that happen? So they say again, because they're resilient. Well, I went look at Resilience, they said the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. And then they gave a one word definition, toughness. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, how intellectual is that? All right. And they also said it's the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape. Like I said before, we used to just say springing back in the south. Bounce back, spring back, same thing. You go back just about where you were or as close to where you came. So it would be just like I come over to her and do that. And then if she just stayed laid back in the chair, she's not resilient. But she did come on back. So that's bounce back. Something that she didn't expect. She didn't come in here to get harassed and, and, and be used as a prop for this obsession. All right? But here it is that it's really sometimes that simple. But like Lauren Hill said, it could all be so simple, but you have to make it hard. So here it is that people who have what you call traditional knowledge in your circles are not being invited to the table 
They're not being put on the adaptation and resilience planning committees that you put together, but you put it together, you make up a plan that will fail as far as they're concerned, but they haven't had a chance to give you input either during the planning of the plan or as reviewers of the plan before you create another plan called the implementation plan <laughs> for your adaptation and resilience strategy. So point number one is knowing if you are not native to a community, you're not the expert. The people who've been in that community for decades, much less centuries, are definitely the experts. And they probably the ones who you ain't going to find at the community meeting in the charrette. They're going to be on the porch. And you're going to have to drop by somebody's house and tarry a little while with them. And once you find out what they like, whether that's a pickle pig foot from the corner stone, or that's a big old pound cake, you might just have to go back over there with them and sit down for a little while and listen to them. Don't even ask questions, except how long have you lived here and has it changed? And you'll be surprised what you will learn. Because that same individual could get carted into a meeting by their younger child or somebody, but they ain't going to say a word in there. They ain't going to sit there for the hour or two hours and don't say nothing except, I'm getting hungry, and I wish y'all take me back to my house. And when they get in the car, y'all bring me here for that foolishness. There are people in there don't know what they're talking about. Because you cannot do such and such on so-and-so. My great-granddaddy house used to be there. And that always flooded. And if they would ask, well, why are you talking now? Why are you doing this? <laughs> I don't want nothing to do with them people. I told you that before you drag me out here. But now you miss all that community knowledge and all that consistent knowledge about the coastline <clears throat> that you say you're working on. But you're going to work there. You should work within the circle. Because a circle is only complete by having all the dots connected. You remember the little churn? Did y'all remember that when you used to have the little dot thing and had number one, number two, number three, number four, and you used to draw them, right? And then at the end you saw the whole picture. We don't get a churn no more with them kind of stuff no more. You're right. <laughs> and that's why they can't think for themselves half the time either. They mm -hmm. Google everything, how to walk, how to talk, <coughs> okay. So the thing is, it taught you how to connect things in your mind. Then after a while, you didn't even use the pen or the pencil. You would first try to figure out the picture, right? Before you ever put the thing on there, didn't you? Right? And you say, and when you finish, you go, I was right. Or when you make that wrong little zigzag because somebody took your attention and you go to the wrong number, oh, look at this. And you try to erase it and get it right. But we can't erase errors when we put in people's spirits. So if we come in telling people a doom and gloom story about something that if we created it, we can do <laughs> it, they won't want to do anything. They'll become catatonic, they'll hide, they'll think, well maybe somebody else in there will come get me after this guy comes home. But they ain't gonna be out here with you trying to help stop it. And those who would like to come, can they afford to? Can they afford to be in a meeting with you? Is your meeting held in the middle of the week during the work day? Is it 5.30 in the evening? And they have an hour and a half worth of traffic to get through, to get there? And they have children? And now how are they going to take care of the children and take care of this meeting? And both things are so important. Well, which one do I choose? Of course, I would think you want to choose your children. But if we all choose our children, we'll listen to each other and realize we cannot do the work we're talking about doing that we're classifying as climate change and talking about being resilient and getting everyone to adapt if we're not willing to change out of our cultures. Whether it's our cultural group we were born into, whether it is how we've been acculturated by where we lived, whether it is the culture of we're women, so the men always treat us a certain way, so let's get our own little group together because let's leave them dudes out of the dudes got the boys club and they say, yeah, let's don't bring the chicks in there or whatever. If we stay in those groups, 
we won't change anything. And the climate we need to change is in here, folks. Is your mind clear or cloudy? In church, if anybody here ever been to church before, you might have heard, if all hearts and minds are clear, <laughs> see, she laughed at you, dog. Know, <laughs> then they say they're going to get a benediction. People started hollering, don't use that as the caveat. Just go and do the benediction. Because you knew everybody my name for Ed Sheeran. <laughs> so we have to clear the climate, change the climate here to change it here to make decisions that help all of us in the circle. Because when we start realizing that if we're all linked in this circle, if I put energy out starting here, what happens with it? Comes around. Right. Comes it's around. Go around and eventually do what? Come, come back to you. Or come, right. or come right. She said she said coming out of here because she shot it back. <laughs> <clears throat> so it comes back to you. So even if you're selfish, you can be the most selfish person in the world. Okay. Your parents let you do anything you wanted all this time. I'm telling you now, think about yourself. Whatever you put now there, it ain't going to just hit everybody else. It's going to hit you too. Yeah. And God forbid you have children because it will hit them eventually too. And so on with their children, children, children. But will they adapt and will they be resilient enough to be able to bounce back from what they get hit with? <coughs> so when we started realizing that, we couldn't just stay on the sea islands in our part of the circle upon the porch, sipping sweet tea. And so many of y'all like to come up there and have a little sweet tea with us on the coffee stands. Then we had to start getting out here and under and overstanding the language of what these other people were writing. Because many times we find out there were maps in there about us and our area where we lived. They said, well, how they come up with a report they ain't talking to us? We could have told them better than this. Okay. So I was invited to such a meeting one time. All the way in Boston. And I was surprised to get to Boston. I didn't want to go because it was cold, too. I didn't like leaving. I didn't want to leave going up there. But I put on the heaviest coat and sweat and stuff I had. And rumbled down and went on up there to find out what do y'all want to sit in a meeting with people from Louisiana and Mississippi and various parts of the East Coast, along with other scientists that have brought us together to talk about adaptation and resistance. But they use this thing I call death by PowerPoint <laughs> and put this screen up there with a report that had some things and it looked like this. And immediately, I'm that person, because I am a scientist, that looks to see what's the legend on there, what are we actually looking at, what is this talking about, and I saw cities in the Gullah Geechee Nation, Jacksonville, Florida, and Charleston, South Carolina, the almost left off the screen at me. And I said, oh, so they talk about it, and I heard each other, people are right up over here, things like, hey, I ain't yet in this. So one day, that's why they do it. They finished their whole report and said, oh, yeah, we already finished that report. I said, oh, but you finished. I thought you wanted some input. They said, oh, yeah, we do. I said, well, why would you want input on something you finished with? They were like, well, 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 it could be an informed future report to we're going to do because we're not finished our work there. We're just finished this report. I said, well, let me tell you what's wrong with your report. I said, I haven't read it in its entirety. It's about that thing. Um, however, just from the baseline of what I'm saying is you're talking about sea level rise and you're talking about it only within urban environments along the southeastern coast. I live on the southeastern coast, but I live on a rural sea island. Where's your juxtaposition data? Please put that slide up so I can see the rural areas and they couldn't. Because they hadn't done that research. They hadn't done that research because the monitors don't exist on the sea islands. They don't exist in the rural areas. So if we're losing entire swaths of data like that, we're not planning. For the people who live in those areas. We left that part at some point. But with linear thinking people, they don't think in circles anyway. This is the line of attack I'm making, and I'm just going straight ahead, right away. Fortunately, because I was in that circle of discussion, this circle broadened like this one they were walking. And they said, Queen Clay, we want to bring 
more about members of the Union of Concerned Scientists to realize. So now you're concerned. They <laughs> said, we are. Because the scientists, we don't want one side of reports out there. We would love to see how we can, can engage with the community and gauge more of what you're talking about. What is being seen in those rural areas so that we can do future reporting that balances it out. And so it's wonderful when I have the opportunity to be in places and spaces like this and have the chance to have someone from Union of Concerned Scientists there because their reports are the ones that often make it into the news on the television, being quoted by politicians, whether for or against what they wrote. But their names are known. And when you say concerned scientists, those two words often go together. So it makes a difference to us because concern is critical to our cultural community. Do you care about me enough to ask me, number one, how are you doing? How are you? So I am with the Union of Concerned Scientists. I'm going to read a little spiel about the Union of Concerned Scientists here, but then we are off to races. Um, UCS, Union of Concerned Scientists, is a national organization that puts science into action to build a healthier planet and a safer world. UCS conducts rigorous technical analysis and uses it to advocate for change, informing decision makers, shaping public opinion, and creating policies to help solve some of today's most pressing problems. We reject rhetoric and actions that divide the nation by race, religion, gender, geography, or any other factor. We stand up for science and evidence-based policymaking, especially those solutions that yield benefits for low-income communities and communities of color too often deny the benefits of clean technology. <coughs> We have a half million members. We have what we call a, uh, the Science Network, which has, at last count, more than 25,000 scientists, engineers, uh, health uh, professionals that we work together to kind of inform decision makers at all levels, not only federal, although most of our work is federal. And uh, we partner with more than 1,500 organizations, including grassroots and communities like the Gala, each of people. So um, without further ado, I'm here today to talk about flooding. So, uh, not only coastal flooding, but also uh, other types of flooding. So, I'm going to start with why is inland America flooding? Outside of the coast, we know about some memorize, I'm going to get to that a little later. But, why is inland America uh, flooding? Well, that's because heavy rainfall is the main primary cause of flooding inland. And, heavy precipitation is increasing in many areas of the globe. As a matter of fact, in the United States alone, 
heavy precipitation events have been dumping more rain in the heaviest rainfalls than any other place in the world. The whole United States has seen an increase in the amount of rain falling in the heaviest <coughs> rain events. Even in places where it is projected, like the Southwest, the Southwest is projected to get drier. Nonetheless, when it does rain, it's likely that then it will be a heavier rain event. And heavy rain events lead to flooding, not always, because on the right-hand side there, you see in blue, where there's been an increase in flooding trends, and in yellow, where there has been a decrease in flooding trends. And you see that they don't match. A lot of people look at those maps and look for the match. Oh, that's because flooding depends on other things other than just the rain. It's topography, it's the cities, it's the rivers, it's previous conditions. If it has rained recently or not, all kinds of things that influence that. So, so that's that. We're also able today to connect these extreme precipitation events with human-caused warming, global warming. This is called the science of attribution. As many of you know, and if you don't know, tell me now. Um, uh, events, very heavy rain events, such as Hurricane Harvey and the Louisiana floods that uh, flooded Baton Rouge a couple of years ago, those have been studied, and they have been found to be a certain percentage more likely than they would have otherwise if there hadn't been any uh, in addition to inland flooding and extreme precipitation, and I'll remind you, uh, I'll tell you all that in the previous session, um, the, there was a, a guy from the city of Charleston, and he was saying that science tells that the biggest um, risk of flooding for Charleston is not coming from sea level rise. It's actually because of the that the science is very clear. So they are really planning this, uh, around the city for these extreme precipitation events. Also along the coast, but the rain goes. <coughs> so in addition to rain and the flooding, we have to deal with the sea level rise. And sea level rise is mostly happening because of the seas getting warmer and warmer water occupies more volume. The water, the sea has nowhere to go but up. So it's rising. And um, there is also the melting from land-based ice. The ice that's already in the, in the water doesn't matter. It's the land-based ice glaciers that are melting at the very fast pace. Now, how much sea level rises this century depends on our options today. What we do from now until mid-century is going to determine if we're going to see that gray line, that pinky line, that yellow line or that green line, which frankly I don't believe is much happening anymore. But you know, we have to prepare because we have locked in a lot of sea level rise already because of the emissions that are already in the atmosphere. But the second half of the century, that's where we can have this big separation because you see, from here on is where they really separate. And that's where we have to focus on them. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change just a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, on the 9th, released a report, which was the, the special report on 1.5 warming that was requested by the United Nations because of the Paris Agreement. You may know about that. That report, the first report that's very specific about what needs to be done to keep warming within 1.5 and 2 degrees in warming. And they say everything is to be done before 2050. By 2050, we need to be net zero emissions. And they, they have a lot of suggestions on how to get there and everything. But not many people believe we can do it. I do. That's just me. Um, so UCS has been working with sea level rise for quite a while. Uh, encroaching tides is the report that, <laughs> that we mentioned. It looked at cities big cities along the eastern and gulf coast. And uh, they found that in very short term, by 2030, some of these cities will mm. see the number of tidal flooding events increase, some of them tenfold, in just 15 years. By 2045, some of them will increase a lot more. So in the short term, a lot of places are going to be seeing an increase in the number of tidal flooding events. Then we also found that in the middle to long term, a lot of places are going to lose a lot of their land 
to ours permanently because the number of tidal events, the number of floods, is going to be so high that they're going to basically be flooding the land the whole time. So certain areas are going to lose up to 90% of their land because the tide is going to be coming so often, it's going to be flooded. It's going to become part of what they call the tide in the world. So, between the increasing number of tides and when it's on the water, what happens? Are you going to sit and wait until you're on <coughs> the water to say, oh crap, I'm on the water. What do I do now? No. You're going to see that creeping. You're going to see that thing coming slowly at you and you say, it flooded just three weeks ago. It's flooding again. Darn it, i got to do something about this. That's what this report did when rising seas came to In that report, we identified which communities along the eastern Gulf coast of the United States would see at least 10% of their usable land inundated by high tide floods at least 26 times per year or every other week on average, the highest tides. And we found that in the short term, by 2030 to 2045, 170 communities would be seen at least 10% of their land inundated. That's a lot. So, um, we also, this, this was done for different scenarios, a low sea level rise scenario, an intermediate and a high sea level rise scenario, and for time frames from 2030 all the way to 2100. So the results are on an interactive map, like this. And uh, you can click on the years, you can click on the, on the scenario, and you can zoom in to almost street level. You can enter an address and you can see how far the water is going into your region, into your neighborhood, where the level of water is, is, is reaching. Um, so, uh, we were asked many times, this is the interactive network 2035, for 2045 there is a small increase, but when you zoom in you see that the increase is significant in the area, in flooded area. So a lot of people asked us, um, what, what about the people who live there? You know, how are people going to be, you know, impacted? And, and oh, of course, low-income communities, minority communities that have been historically disenfranchised are going to be hit the worst. And not only because their home is going to be flooded, the access, the access to their, to their workplace, the access to the schools for their children, the access to the, the any any basic services, they can be hit hard. And if they cannot go to work. Many of them can be uh, day wagers. They will not get paid. So the impacts can be, you know, really, really huge. And we found that by 2035, over 50% of the communities that are going to be chronically inundated, as we call it, 10%, 26 times a year, over 50% have at least one census tract that have high socioeconomic vulnerability as measured by the Social Vulnerability Index from University of Carolina. Um, I can tell you more about it if you uh, haven't heard about it, but it uses variables such as income, age, language, um, all, all kinds of census variables to kind of build this index. So, so low income and minority populations will be very, hit very hard. So, and a lot of people also ask us, who is there? Who is in the way of that water? And then the first answer, well, this is not for us to figure out. We get the maps and the city calendars and the people who live there look at the map and they know it's there. Well, turns out that we ended up doing that. We got the uh, information from the Zillow um, online uh, real estate company, and we overlaid Zillow um, information with those inundated, chronic inundated areas. And what we found is that by 2045, over 300,000 homes be at risk of this chronic inundation, and over 70,000 commercial properties. That number is more than 2 million by the end of the century. And this is with a high sea level rise scenario, which is the trajectory we're on. So we, we use that sea level rise scenario to kind of stress the fact that we need to pay attention right now, or things will get really bad. Um, the results can be seen by state, by community, by zip code level, and by congressional 
district. I have all three coastal congressional districts for North Carolina and all three for South Carolina there on that chair. Very useful, we are a week from elections. So um, it tells you how many homes uh, in, the, uh, in that congressional district are gonna be at risk of, of um, that chronic inundation. So very, very handy. So this, this is at state level. The national overview, the numbers I already told you. Uh, state level results for South Carolina, 16,000, over, over 16,000 homes by 2045. Uh, community level results, you can see the communities in the, in the legend there, the darker, the more homes at risk. And I focus on putting some of the, whoops, this shouldn't be useful, but you know. <laughs> you can see zip code level results in the congressional district results. So the economic impacts of flooding, of course, can reach. It can have many ramifications. Um, not only the housing market, but the whole, the whole economy of these communities can be impacted because if the home gets flooded and people start moving out or people cannot recover from a flood, that it's like this cascading effect. There will also be implications for the wider economy. As somebody mentioned today, the coast is very important for the economy of the whole country. And the tax base is going to be affected. And people in the rest of the country, their taxes are going to be used to, tax, you know, to help the people on the coast. So there's all this whole this whole thing we call this the I forget the name. It has very cool names. Um, these circles, you know, the, of all the all the impacts of the economy. But it's just something to keep in mind that if one community getting flooded goes beyond just that community being flooded. There's a lot more that is, is at stake there. We also found for this report that to fall on the water, the water, the homes, that poverty and race uh, together create hot spots of risk nationwide by 2045. 175 communities can see 10% or more of their housing stock at risk. 40% of those are low income communities with poverty levels above the national average. And many of them have majority African American and um, indigenous peoples, you know, Native American. So these people are going to be impacted. They are in the way of the water. And they may not have all the resources that they need to, be, to bounce back. So this is something that we are very, very concerned about. So um, our challenges and choices. Um, We can, we can learn about the challenges and uh, use the resources available to make um, <coughs> decent choices. When there is, we're talking about uh, inundation and flooding, there are basically three choices that you can have. You can defend against the water with walls, worms, you know, putting protections. That not always works, and it's expensive, and it doesn't last forever. You can accommodate the water. You can have elevated houses, you can create ponds and retention ponds where the water can come without creating any damage and you know so there won't be too much economic impact that there will be just this area that can accommodate the water. And retreat is a word that a lot of people don't like, but sometimes you just have to move out of the waterway. If you if you cannot stay there anymore because it's flooding so much and none of the other options work, you have to move out of harm's way. It's it just doesn't make sense. You have to use common sense many times. So, and I would highlight that a lot of this, as Queen mentioned, is because people knew what they had to do originally. They had been there for hundreds of years. They had their relationship with the land and with nature. And then colonialism comes in, missionaries, all kinds of people. And they come and they build structures that are permanent, they build those roads that have, cannot be moved. They build the library, the church, everything. And then people don't have that mobility anymore. They cannot go and escape the water. They don't have the resources. They used to have an area that they would go when it's flooded. Now they have to go inland and stay there for a month or two months until areas are rebuilt. Stay with relatives somewhere else. So it's, it's a completely different dynamic. And, um, and that's something that we always like to bring up. 
we need a lot more uh, policies. We need a lot um, improved mapping. We know that the FEMA mapping does not reflect the flooded areas. We have overlaid areas that's not the forest with Matthew, with everybody. Flooded areas are outside of FEMA 500 years old. That is, it's, it just doesn't work. You know, we get this extreme events. Hurricanes are bringing a lot more rain. They, you just need better mapping. You need pre-disaster, post-disaster. You need all those things that can can help a community be more prepared and more resilient ahead of the disaster, not only after the disaster. Because we know that each dollar invested in pre-mitigation is worth at least six post-mitigation. So we got to help that, and we have to have better insurance. The National Flood Insurance Program, which is not just insurance, it's a whole floodplain management program has several provisions that are not fully implemented. So it has to be reformed and all these provisions need to be implemented so that you know, flood insurance is more accessible to all those that need it. Need to educate our policy, our policy makers and other stakeholders, get the congressional district fact sheet, go talk to your representatives, talk to your city people, who have, have town halls, express your concerns and have a voice because if you don't have a voice you, you're not really going to be heard nobody's going to care about you if you don't have a voice know your risk we have to we have to do our homework we cannot just simply um we cannot just simply expect everybody to tell us what to do we cannot just sit there and say hey this is going to flood wow i didn't know do our, do our homework. We have a brochure called Know Your Risk for uh, home buyers and for homeowners that kind of gives a lot of resources where you can look if you are in a, in a dangerous area, if you are in a risky area, and what you can do to protect yourself. So that's a very important thing that you need to do. All our product, products are online, as I mentioned. All the, the brochure, the whole report, all the interactive maps where you can enter addresses and see where the water is and how many homes are at risk. And I want to, I want to end. I'm going to go over a little bit. I'm going to end with a, <laughs> with a, on a, on a, 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 my positive note. That's how I always like to end. Um, very recently, I came into the term of the philosophy. And it's described as the morning of ecosystems and species and ways of life that are disappearing as the planet warms. So people who used to depend on some fisheries, they used to have a way of life that included some um, forest products. All these things are disappearing because global warming is changing a lot of these dynamics. Many of these systems do not provide the same services anymore. And people have to go and find different ways of having those services provided. And, and that can have an impact, can have a, a psychological impact and emotional impact on people. And this is, this is a real thing. And uh, it, it resonated with me because I am an ecologist by, you know, I studied ecology for most of my life before I left study climate change. And other things that I'm going to go into the, the social cohesiveness and the social support system, when Katrina hit, Everybody expected that the, the black communities that were hit the hardest and that had the least resources would be the ones that would take the longest time and have the hardest time to bounce back. Well, that didn't happen. A lot of those communities bounced back way before everybody expected. And why was that? Social support. They had their social support. They supported each other. They talked to each other. Are you OK? What do you need? They gathered together in their community. They became cohesive. They became more, more together than they were before, and that helps with the recovery. That's a very important thing. But of course, all the people who have been there forever, they know this. But it takes a scientist to write something, a paper, in a scientific paper, to you know, let Queen know, hey, your community does really well because it's been there for 400 years, and you know, your society is very smart. <laughs> so yeah, research. Now, he has shown what Quinn has always known in her people, <laughs> that communities with tight new connections recover better, many times faster, and the social network and support system enables them to bounce back. And traditional knowledge. Now, 
while traditional knowledge really helps, and people who have traditional knowledge really help in adaptation and resilience, uh, the old the old's new again, just because the scientists said it? No, we know that's not true. It's always, it's always been there, and we know how the people react to it. Um, from, and resilient communities drive residents towards a resilient mindset, so we have to keep that in mind. It's not an individual, it's the community thinking, it's that group thinking. And where do we go from here? We go to the National Forum. <laughs> <laughs> I have to put a it plug. Um, it's, it's, in, it's in April, 2019, in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I hope to see many of you there. And um, I'll be happy to take any, any questions uh, afterwards. Thank you. So what we're going to do, we're going to take the questions right after we take another part yeah. of this job. Yeah. Because it's interesting. I never saw her PowerPoint. I don't like watching PowerPoint. <laughs> so I had no idea why her head was coming off her neck over there while I was talking until I saw it. She was like, yes, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> we're on the same page. This, we're always on the same page, singing from the same sheet of music. And that's what makes it so beautiful. Because when you can talk to one another, you can create that harmony that becomes the melody you can sing with. And that can be that melody that you use along the shore to work together. There's a song that we sing called Walk Together Chicken, and Don't You Get Very Weary, Great Camp Meeting Promise Land. And so, someone else who arrived on our shore one day and wanted to do the same things that Dr. Astrid just said are necessary. Update and create some maps. Because most of the maps from Jacksonville, North Carolina to Jacksonville, Florida, either planning maps, right, that talk about the zoning of an area now, or plantation maps, or both, because a lot of what's being planned are gated plantations. Okay, so they said, well, what about the Gullah Geechee? Where, where are y'all's maps? I said, that's what we need done. I said, so y'all are the map making people? They were like, we're geographers. I said, oh, so geographers make maps. They said, well, actually, cartographers make maps. So I'm saying, so why are you talking to me about the map then? I don't need you. I need the cartographers. They were like, no, 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 but wait. But what we do is we don't just stand there and sketch the map, OK, like that. They do that part, but we do the layers. What goes into the map, like all that data that you saw here, the vulnerability indexes, the population. What kind of population is it? What is it we're looking at? Are we looking at fishing species there? Are we looking at the number of people that fish from that dock? Are we looking at the number of tourists that come in and make your population 10 times as much? Are we looking at these numbers? And what numbers do you want us to add to the layers of what already exists? Because we can go back to the maps of 1865, for instance, and talk from the perspective of y'all owning land. I said, well, hold it. I said, hell no, nah, we owned our land since 1862, and I still live on it. Really? Really? So then they're like, well, then we need to go back that far, or even go to the maps from at least 1800, layering with the maps and how they changed during, right after we got our land during the Civil War, but right after Reconstruction and then layer it with what's happened since, and see what direction things are going in, and then see how these could be used by the community, and not just have maps being used out there by those who come to the community to plan for the community without talking to the community. But instead, the community would have its own materials to come back and be a part of the dialogue, and to even challenge sometimes what they might have had, because you just heard how old the FEMA maps are, OK? So it's very important to have others that you can collaborate with that come in and say, we're not coming to tell you what to do, because we have a thesis that we have to write about you, and our theory about you is this, so let us prove it. No, they come in and say, how can we help? What resources are needed here? And if we have access to them, maybe we can help resource the community and we can further our collaboration and then maybe update the world and use this traditional knowledge, meet science, 
meet collaboration and put it all together. So one of the people that has a piece in our book that you see standing up here, we be Gullah Geechee, all right, which is actually a cultural capital and collaboration anthology, is Dr. Kate Derrickson, who, interestingly enough, does not live or work on the coast unless she come to visit us. She's actually at the University of Minnesota. So a lot of people go, wait a minute, somebody in Minnesota work with y'all? I see it, interestingly enough, working with us better than y'all who live on the coast. All right? Because she's listening. And so our students. And then they go in the field with us. They don't send us in the field and have us bring the data back to them and then they write it down and draw a map. Or they don't go in the field behind our backs, talk to everybody else and go back to the university and then eventually just show up at a conference and then we see them there again. They don't just sweep in. They actually come and sit on the porch or under the oak tree a little while when it's not raining so that it's not flood inundated um, to actually grasp the community's need and see how we can do just what that song says, walk together, chill. All right? So I bring now Dr. Kate so that she can show you some of the work we've been doing. Actually, okay. last time I was on your porch with your mom, it was It was raining, raining, but you were on the porch. Really and it's cold yes. in porch, yes. too. Yes, not up the door. <laughs> um, yes. So it seems like I should now show you a bunch of really beautiful maps, but that's not what I'm used to. I'm going to actually talk about the process, as Queen suggested. So I'm going to pick it up, actually, after uh, in 2008, 2009, 2010, when I was doing my dissertation research on post-Katrina redevelopment um, in Biloxi, Mississippi, in Gulfport, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And while it is true that the historically black neighborhoods were, um, ha have really important things that help them redevelop or help them survive and thrive and be resilient, it was also really clear that forms of investment in rebuilding were really strongly uh, distributed away from those spaces. Um, uh, but at the same time, so, but, but what nobody was talking about really in 2008, 2009, 2010 was resilience. So I spent a lot of time in post-hurricane post redevelopment circles in that time, and people weren't really talking about resilience. Um, a little bit, some designers were talking about resilient design a little bit. So, but they were talking about building back, and what my dissertation research was on was how funds um, and investments were distributed, and it found that it was really disadvantaged historically black neighborhoods in that region. Um, and then I moved to uh, the United Kingdom for a little while, um, and, and tried to, and was working with some communities there, and that's where I first heard this word resilience in 2000. <laughs> but, um, you know, I heard the idea of resilience is a normative good to which communities ought to aspire that was in a relationship with expertise. Um, and I first came across that in 2010, 2011. Um, and in the United Kingdom at the time, you had a governing party that was really interested in rolling back um, state forms of investment in low-income communities and historically marginalized communities. And so I was starting to see a pattern here of disinvestment in historically marginalized communities and the rise of this idea that communities ought to be resilient. And so I got really skeptical to this idea of simultaneous disinvestment and the promotion of the idea that you just keep taking knock after knock and you ought to have a character which is resilient and then you will be able to endure these economic changes and these environmental changes. So this community that I was working with in Glasgow and I started talking about, is resilience what you desire or what is the normative good to which you aspire? Um, and so we, we were working on that question and we came up with these kind of three critiques of the idea of resilience. Now, of course we want people to be resilient. I have children, one of the most important characteristics that you want to develop in your child is resilience. As a human quality and character, of course you want places to be resilient and people to be resilient but I was interested in this idea of resilience as a normative good that planners and um, you know non NGOs and nonprofits would be kind of proselytizing or using as the kind of framework to which communities ought to aspire. And what we found was that the, what constituted a resilient community was usually defined from a top-down perspective. And that was, was in, we were writing this in 2011, 2012, 2013, and obviously there's been a thousand permutations of resilience. 
historians since then. Um, but at the time, it was really often defined in top-down ways. And it didn't really challenge the status quo. It didn't, it didn't engage people in saying, like, what do you want the future to look like? It was like, how are you going to survive this take-it-for-get-granted um, assumption that both you know, the environment's going to change, which clearly it is, but then the economy is going to change, and forms of state investment are going to uh, change and, and be directed away from you. Um, and then, yeah, it, related, it took those wider structures for granted. And so working with this community in, in Scotland, we started thinking, what do we actually want to promote? What is the character of communities that we wanted to, want to promote? And we worked on this idea of self-determination and what constitutes a community that can enact self-determination. That's a community full of the resources that it needs to realize the urban and environmental futures that it wants to see. And so we started talking about this idea of resourcefulness as an alternative to resilience. Um, and that had two dimensions. One as the normative good to which we think communities could aspire, and that experts ought to be attentive to. So what we should be attentive to, those of us who spend our lives getting PhDs and doing writing reports, should be attentive to how we can uh, direct resources to communities. Um, but it was also about an ethical practice of scholarly research. In other words, what is the relationship that we develop in the process of collaborating with communities? And what is our relationship to this collaborative process? It is as a resource. Um, and that ethical posture of collaboration has been really helpful for me uh, and my, my students to think about what, what, do we, what do we have to offer? Um, it's not some kind of plan. It's a set of resources that we want to develop um, that help then make the community feel even more resourceful. And so in that paper, we talk about these four dimensions um, of resourcefulness that I'm, I'm going to just kind of gloss over for now, the things that will seem, seem familiar to you. Um, and then we're talking about money. We're talking about folk knowledge or indigenous knowledge or local knowledges. But we're also talking about technical knowledges. Like the communities that we work with want expertise. They just want science to ask and answer the questions that they want the answer to. So it's not that people don't want you know, all the stuff that universities have. They just want to be able to shape how communities ask and answer questions. And then recognition is a key component, being understood as a culturally distinct group of people who have a shared set of values and a shared future um, is an important dimension of resourcefulness. Um, and so when we, when we think about those pieces, when we do our research together, we think about how can we provide material resources? How can we amplify folk knowledges? Um, <clears throat> how can we develop skills that are valuable to our community-based partners? Um, and how can our scholarly work uh, contribute to cultural recognition? Um, and for us, that means not being experts in or on Gullah Geechee's. Often when I present my work, people, I think, expect me to come with like a sweet grass basket and, you know, a whole bunch of sewing work. You should be sewing work. <laughs> you know, exactly. Teach people how to sew a sweet grass basket. Yeah. You know, people expect something from people who do collaborative work with communities. Um, and I'm not an expert in Gullah Geechee's or on Gullah Geechee's by any means. Uh, my research is on the state, and I am an expert in, in, in capitalism and the state, so we'll talk about that another time. But, um, <laughs> but I research and think about that from, in, in relation to the questions that my collaborators want asked and answered. Um, really, they just want to ask, but then <laughs> I'm talking about capitalism. Um, okay, so another um, <clears throat> a piece of this is um, how we design our research. So this is an approach to co-developing research. Um, that we put together, where yes, we work in a research university, and there are conditions of our continued employment which are driving research agendas and contributing to intellectual debates um, and theoretical conversation. But we triangulate, triangulate that with um, the questions that our collaborators want to know the answer to, um, and who's served by knowing. Like, why do we want to know this? And I think that that's a really important question when we think about um, all the things that Astrid was talking about with respect to flooding and forms of vulnerability and approaches to resilience. Who wants to know 
and why? What areas are we imagining need to be redeveloped? Where do we think retreat has to happen? Where do we think fortification has to happen? Who is a climate refugee? What does it mean to call someone a climate refugee? What does it mean to introduce that term? Um, so what's served in the act of knowing? What are the consequences of knowing? What are the stakes of knowing? And really taking some responsibility um, for that. And people, that makes some people uncomfortable, but I think the way that I think about that is that there's an endless number of questions you could ask. What makes you choose the questions that you choose? And what are the stakes of the, those choices that you make? Um, and so, Angelic Beach Nation, um, that has meant asking what, you know, asking questions and working on projects that our collaborators think are urgent. Um, thinking about what resources we have to support those projects. So I don't think about these projects as being my projects. I think about myself as a person working on these projects who has a set of resources to bring to the table. Um, I have undergraduate and graduate labor. I have access to map makers. I'm not a map maker, but I have access to them. Um, I have institutional research and institutional funding, uh, and support from the libraries who have been really important collaborators with us recently. Um, and I have access to and a relationship with a lot of environmental scientists who are starting to come to the realization <coughs> that but uh, that business as usual approaches to ivory tower science are just not working. And so all this is really showing us is that, all this is really suggesting is that, you know, my, my colleagues in the environmental sciences tend to study um, things that their disciplines think are important. And they go out and do a study, you know, my, 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 I'm on a lot of ecology committees and these ecology students come in thinking like, I'm gonna study how to change the world, basically, or how to make the world a better place to live, and they finish being an expert on how one particular sediment moves to one particular kind of stream, because that's the interesting question to their discipline. And then they write a, and then they write a, a dissertation on it, and they distribute the findings, and they try to make those findings shape policy. Um, and then they have to hope that that policy, or the needs of that policy, then shape some kinds of research questions. And what we're trying to do with this initiative that I'm part of called the CREATE Initiative is, I won't spend a ton of time on this, but we're trying to invert that process to make the science questions collaborative questions uh, from the outset. So what do communities want to know the answer to? And that should drive the science questions that we're asking rather than our disciplinary, our unique, specific, um, excuse me, contingent disciplinary um, uh, formulations. So we, this has us asking those questions at higher ed based research with practitioners and change agents from the, from the beginning. Um, developing these kinds of shared understandings of the problem, a collaborative anal a context for analysis of the findings, um, and a collaborative solution generation. So we're not putting out solutions out in the world that our, our collaborators haven't vetted, haven't, we don't understand the stakes of the solutions that we're proposing if we're not working with the community that says, look, if you say that, if you start walking around saying X, Y, or Z, that's, this is how that's gonna impact us. Mm -hmm. So really keeping everybody at the table at these key stages. Um, and then using that as a kind of driver for our, our science. And you know, my, my collaborators, um, in ecology and in earth sciences, I think we're really skeptical of this kind of approach five or six or seven years ago. In the past few years, there has been a sense of like, business as usual is not working. We, we don't have science questions. We don't have a ton of science questions about climate change. Now we have political questions about climate change. And so how, and how can we change the context in which we're producing science so that the people who are in a position to do something about it um, trust the science that we're, we're being. Um, and so uh, that, this is all part of a, 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 a initiative that I'm part of at the University of Minnesota called the CREATE Initiative. Um, and through that, we've been working with um, a Glenda Simmons, Representative Glenda Simmons Jenkins of the Gullah Geechee Nation, who is in Nassau, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Nassau County in North Florida. And we have been partnering with the University of Minnesota Libraries which has been kind of unexpected, but this is this great resource, um, to do this kind of ongoing collaborative research with undergraduate researchers, community members, um, on questions that um, folks in Nassau County are interested in having asked and answered.
answered. And so we spent a week together. Um, you know, my students and I have been going back and forth to Florida for a while. But uh, a representative, Les Simmons Jenkins, and her daughter came up to Minnesota in January. I felt so bad for them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Very bad. It was, it was terrible. Um, but they were troopers. I had to like give them jackets because you know, they didn't have enough. But anyway, it was great to have them there, and it was important to have. I felt. And, and I think uh, Representative Simmons Jenkins felt too that it was really important to not have us always be in their space, but to have to see what happens when um, you know the whole apparatus of the research university has to be mobilized to support what they're interested in and what their needs are. Um, and so that alone was a really good and important process. Um, and so and to have the kind of you know if you got a degree at a research university or work at a research university, the amount of resources there are incredible. Um, and so to be able to have those mobilized, you know, as we were going, we innovated on methods um, through the collaboration and we were able to generate things like right away, you know, like students, they would say like, you know what I really want to know is, you know, this. And then a student would go and spend six hours figuring it out. The next day we would show up and it was like, we found all the things that we didn't know the answer to. So this is Nassau County. Um, and we learned that this is the, the red is the land owned by Ryanair, which is uh, formerly a turpentine company, a paper company, and now a land development company. Um, and so we were trying to understand the dynamics of land development and land tenure, and we were able to produce this map with the support of librarians um, that showed exactly how much land Ryanair owned. And that was a question that it was pretty easy for the undergrads and the librarians to answer, but something that Glenda had no way of answering. And now she has this resource, which is something that she was really interested in. And this other map was a, came out of this graph, excuse me, came out of this question of how has Nassau County changed? And that bottom line there uh, is African American population, and that red line there is a, a white population, and then the blue line is the overall population. And so you can see the twin pressures that Gullah Geechee's live in this county are facing. You have this massive um, property owner, this massive landowner that is no, for whom it's no longer profitable to make paper. Now land development is a profitable uh, way to, to mobilize their assets combined with massive in-migration. And this is the context. This helped them understand the context um, in which all of this was playing out. And I want to show you Um, okay. They're in the process of making a story map for Glenda. That's not finished by any means, but I just yeah, it went off the screen. You got to bring it back up on the screen. It disappeared. As soon as you switched out. Still help you. Text me. Yeah. 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 We're all going to log in. <laughs> thought would be valuable um, for them to have. It's a, a tool to be able to share the story um, that, that we have, I don't want to say uncovered, but that we have been able to piece together through our collaborations in the last couple of years. Um, and so, you know, this is the one that's most together so far. But it tells the story of eminent domain and family land tenure and um, land taking in this area. Um, and different forms of development um, and the struggles that people are facing to keep their property. Um, and I don't think the map tour is done, but it, when it's when this is finished, uh, the goal is for it to be a resource for Representative Simmons Jenkins as she tries to tell the Gullah Geechee story of Nassau County, which is a story <coughs> that is really, really, really subsumed, especially in that area. Like mm -hmm. You go to places like St. Helena, where you know everybody knows that this is a Gullah Geechee island. 
Um, but this is less of a story that people know about in Nassau County. And so um, the representatives of these Jenkins thought it would be really valuable to have this. And so the, 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 the main point that I want to close on here is that I didn't go down there to say what my students and I are interested in questions around land loss. Tell us about how land use has changed over time. We spent years working together to think what questions you have, how can we work together to answer them, and what products would be useful for you to realize, to, to advocate for the futures that you want to see. Um, and so that's one example. I didn't have any maps, so I'm going to show you. <laughs> So I'll hand it over to Queen for questions. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. So now, yeah. Uh, and Dr. Kate, if y'all bring your chairs up here, close to the front, we're going to have a little discussion about the future of land use. Thank you. That's what I was saying. It's so appropriate that Glenn was up there. Um, because when this conference was originally planned, Representative Glenda Simmons Jenkins was going to present for this session. But when it got switched, then she couldn't make this set of dates. So to actually see now, you see Dr. Kate's all, no, I don't have an actual map. But that's better than a map because you have a whole story. And as you see, part of our journey with the Gullah Geechee Nation is being able to provide an entire story. It's not about that one flat medium that someone just looks at and figures, well, we got your peg because you're right there on that one dot. No, it's the entire story and how does it flow and how does it connect and how can we link to one another in this circle. So the last person that came in, Dr. Ashton, you take this chair, let her take your chair so she'll be in the circle. Oh, okay. Um, So, any questions for any of the three of us? Well, y'all knew all this stuff, and y'all let me lead this session at all. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Go right ahead. Um, uh, this is the closest exposure I've had to the Gullah Geechee Nation mm -hmm. and uh, information as it relates to it. Although I've heard about it and read some things, and we don't know where it really came from. My question is historically, as it is in the county, I'm a, a county commissioner from Greenville, North Carolina, and um, my district is the, uh, the flooded area mm -hmm. of the district. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the fears that exists among people that I represent is that the loss of land as it re relates to the fact that we are always, in quote, flooding or it's causing uh, costing the government a lot because our area flood and it's not necessarily hurricane related. It's um, rainfall. rainfall. And so the effort is, and um, Su Suzanne brought me here for this, but and she doesn't know that the effort for the landowner who's black, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them are losing land because of that, and the government will not allow them to maintain or do with their land as other counterparts in the community would do. And so they, uh, we are finding that African Americans are losing a lot of land due to squeezing um, communication of uh, problems. And uh, if you don't get, you know, it's going to cost you more because we're not going to help you. So how do you find that what you study with in your two places that uh, will help? Because this last uh, slide didn't show much of the, uh, the Gullah Nation as retaining land. It's right. being changed, exchange ends. Mm -hmm. So how uh, do you feel about that? Well, I, I will try to cap encapsulate. This part that's still being worked on, this is just one very small area of the Gullah Geechee Nation. So basically, as soon as you cross the Georgia border into Florida, this is there. This is in the Uly O'Neill community. And what has happened is they've lost a lot of land over time because of eminent domain and the yeah. lack of knowledge of the law, like you said, and the lack of the ability to communicate effectively 
in these county council meetings and so on in the state meetings to stop it from happening. One of the main reasons is because they were disjunctive. If you and I, if, if some of y'all watch Bewitched, I noticed it was on TV again the other night, Only Runs. I often use that as an example because if you ever watched Bewitched, you knew she could twink her nose and do anything, right? So I often wish I could twink my nose and drop people in the spot that I'm talking about when we're talking about it. Because if I dropped you there now and you stopped the first black person and said, are you Gullah Geechee? Oh no, I heard of those people on. See, I had cousins that were Gullah Geechee and they in Georgia. That's what they would tell you. Or my grandmama was that, but she was in Georgia. How your grandmama something that you're not? You see what I'm saying? So that's so why I ask people, so, so cats have puppies now? You know, <laughs> so what are you talking about? But what has happened is because of generations of people being told, get away from being Geechee. Do not tell anyone you're Gullah Geechee. And rather want some people going somewhere, don't let any of you to crack your teeth like Alicia. So definitely never speak your language in front of outsiders. So when people migrated largely into Florida from Georgia, not as many went southward from South Carolina as did from Georgia into Florida to work on the ports, they then were disjuncted. They were no longer in the communities that Dr. Astor talked about and they gave them support other than right at the dock. But then my house might be here, and your house is across town, and then her house is somewhere else, and we're all cousins, but we're not together like we used to be on a family compound. So then, when people set laws, you don't even have anything to fight as a collective, because we're all split up in different places. That's what happened with the land ownership there. They bought land over time as they could afford it in the early 1900s. They didn't have any idea that later there would be this so-called boom of destruction meant where all these people want to live in Florida. And so now even the counties would work against you to say, well, by eminent domain, because so many people come here, we need to widen the road. So even on that slide that said O'Neill, the church, the church, I can hardly find it when I go there now. It used to be a two-lane road when I first started going there. It's four <coughs> lanes now, and every time I go there, it's still part of the road is under construction. <coughs> so I have to always drive slow, like, is this the way I'm supposed to go now? And so the family, their family, and the Motley for that one right there. So right here, this road here that's coming out didn't always exist. You right. see that traffic light right there right. is taking them to that four lanes in front. Mm -hmm. They've had their property cut off twice. Okay, so these are things that our community members, like you said, most black communities, no matter where I go, they're not familiar with this terminology about eminent domains. They don't know what CRAs are and all these new zoning terms that come up, you know, overnight sometimes that policymakers create to blight your community mm -hmm. and say you got to move out, much less if you don't have a collective group to fight on your behalf or they come in as a unit, as a group, not as individual family members and individual property owners, they're not listening to you. Because what you don't know a lot of times is these people who live in these areas that get built like this become members of the homeowners association. So okay, I, so they come in as a collective. So I wanna know, mm -hmm. do you share mm -hmm. that 1600 knowledge of how to sustain the wind, oh, the yes, water, the whatever. Yes, ma'am. We do have you the share it among those of us like me who we don't do. know it that I can. We do. Better. We have a conference every year now called the Black Folks Land Legacy Conference. And guess what? More people who are not black folks show up to the conference than black folks. I never heard of it. Yeah. So I'm just saying it's fairly new, but that is the place that we do other than the 50,000 different things that I have on the internet of me talking about this same issue. There's videos, there's audio, there's documents, there's reports, there's this, there's that. There's plenty of stuff out there. So you want I've been to doing this almost 40 years. Yeah. yeah, yeah, other than scientific, yeah. I do think that that's one role that academics can play too, yeah. is that is, is creating infrastructure as a connection. You know, a lot of times people are working so hard to keep it on their, the place where they live for a lot of understandable reasons. But in my, you know, 15 years of doing this work, I've seen very different approaches to being really successful at staving off different forms of development and being trying to bring people together, both just even in the Southeast or internationally. Like we've done work to, you know, bring people from like 
from Colony Gucci Nation yeah, to Glasgow yeah. to Leeds to meet you know people Folks from South Africa. Yeah, uh, to meet yeah. people from all over the world to think about like how do you retain your land? How do you deal with environmental change? How do you retain your cultural continuity in the face of that kind of change? So I think that's something that practitioners or academics can play a role in um, and resource it. Yeah. So it's it. You got to come. <laughs> I would tell you like to tell the gentleman listen, are you gonna pay my ticket? <laughs> no, I'm not oh, you take it you are. You're riding Craigville, North Carolina to get to South Carolina. Get the car. Any other? No? Really? We bored you stiff. <laughs> no? I, I got one yes. I want to ask um, Dr. Yeah. Um, yeah, um so in the with the global warming and the cause of greenhouse gases and stuff and I'm just amazed at our over-dependence on fossil fuels as a, as a global society. I mean, and as a microcosm of that, Coca-Cola and Pepsi, leading manufacturers of, pe of, of drinks, continuing to manufacture uh, poly polychemical bottles or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and now they're ending up in the oceans and on the beaches, and, and that's just a, that's one small example. But consumers, we oh, yeah. are continue to endorse this right. And surely they can come up with a biodegradable alternative to it drink. It exists food. already. They, they have, okay, yeah. It exists already. Yeah. Biodegradable but, plastic for beverages and, yeah. Okay, but how do we, that, to me, the, the, the power brokers who who are members of these UN, United Nations Council on this, Council on that, or, you know, I don't feel like they're really doing enough. They hold so much power economically and in the governments, but yet, as a society, we continue to... Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. There, are, uh, there are two things that I'll say on that. First, there is no sense of urgency yet. And people will only do stuff when they are, like, losing it. On the edge. There is no sense of urgency, because it's too beautiful, there are two beautiful places, beautiful beaches, beautiful houses. Oh, they are flooding, but I am not. Right. So there's that sense of urgency. Only when there is a sense of urgency, then there is the reliance on technology. People do not want to change their ways of life. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to do that. But the report that just came out in the, in the beginning of this month states it very <coughs> clear. Profound changes are going to be needed if we are to tackle this at the level that we need to prevent changes in the world that are irreversible. And people don't think about that. They say if that force disappears, no big deal. But if a 50 forests disappear, what's the further impact on the climate? What's the further impact on pollinators, on ecosystem services, on water? You lose water here, there is a drought there. You know, so there are lots of things that people are not thinking about because there's no sense of urgency. But if those people that you mentioned, who are big stakeholders and who have the means and who have the voice to really speak out, and create change and effect real change. If they spoke out and they started a movement, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people would follow because there's money to be made. Yeah. There is money to be made. And if, if, if all these people want to make money. Right. So there is money there. Right. There's no urgency. There's no, you know, they, yeah. they're not going to inertia. They don't want to, you know, get up and start doing things because, hey, it's been yeah. working. Everything right. I've been doing has been, it's been working for me financially. Exactly. Right. So, you know, nobody's pushing. Sense, yeah. But I would say this, though. I would say this to that, because we just had this discussion on lunch. Um, to me, the most exciting activity that has gone on in regard to your question was not covered in the news, because it was happening while there were storms raging across the world. There was a hurricane headed to the East Coast. There's a typhoon headed to the West Coast, simultaneously with the Global Climate Action Summit. Oh, yeah. Michael Bloomberg and his <laughs> friends, Al Gore and um, what was it, Governor Kerry, it was a whole yeah. plethora yeah. Yeah. of people yeah. who are million and multi-millionaires yeah. and billionaires okay. who stepped in the arena to say, let me show y'all something. Annie up, I put my money on the table, we can make money, let's go green, we're going to do it, we're going to accomplish the Paris Agreement. And people cheered, they roared, people from the indigenous communities were there, I was there of course, I was one of the speakers, you can see the presentation yeah. I did. Um, so there are people in those positions 
who have the leverage power that golf with these guys at these corporations that you're talking yeah. about, who take and lobby money when they were politicians mm -hmm. from some of them, who sit down with them and go, look, dude, we can do this. We need you to change. So I would give them some time yes. because that was a very powerful event, but it didn't get media coverage because the media was looking at the weather. Yes. Okay? And so the average person doesn't think anything's happening. I'm trying to tell you, those over 4,000 people that we were wow. in there with mm -hmm. were very encouraging that mm -hmm. a whole lot's happening from that day forward. And there were even companies there who are on the New York Stock Exchange because they've gone green and have things you can buy into. So again, the one who pays the piper calls the tune. Mm -hmm. So when you say, what do we do, what do we do? You stop buying those companies you mentioned products until they go green, then they'll do it. That's when it'll be urgent. Because their stocks drop, they're going to want to find out why. And if they find out it's because all these other people, like in South Carolina, we have the bag ban going on on the coast. Mm -hmm. If we ban plastic bags, then the next thing we should be doing is banning plastic bottles and whatnot. So if they realize that, oh my God, we're going to lose this, but there is an alternative, they'll start buying that alternative and using it because they keep you drinking their product, not that their products are healthy for your body. So that's the thing. Yeah. So definitely, I, I would say to you, I am encouraged and be encouraged that I don't think that group that we were with in California is mm. going to be stopped. Right. <laughs> yeah. Can I just say one yeah. thing about the sense of urgency? I mean, I think when you, uh, just a very quick anecdote, I was working Speak on up a, now. Okay, I was working on an island, um, one of the sea islands that was, mo it was an entire, the whole island was a gated community yeah. of late. And I expected all these people to tell me that sea level rise wasn't a thing. And they said, oh yeah, no, this island's gonna be underwater in like 2030. Yeah. And they were just sort of like, we'll just move somewhere else. I mean, they yeah, just, that's they, what they, they were, do. yeah, they were, they were second homes mostly. Right. And there was just a sort of like, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Now, if you go to St. Helena, it matters to people right. if it's gonna be underwater. If you go work with landless peasants in Bangladesh, it yeah. matters to them yeah. where it's gonna be underwater. And so, like, that's this lack of sense of urgency in kind of mainstream or wealthy society combined with like the extreme sense of urgency in communities that have an attachment to land right. who won't just live someplace else right. it is, it is really powerful. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I think that those voices really need to be elevated is because once we get that sense of urgency mm -hmm. from people who have means and capacity, they're gonna just try to run. Yeah, them. run, run, <coughs> run, run yeah. Shot. Things are gonna yeah. happen. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other? The county has been complicit in the destruction mm -hmm. that's caused the displacement of thousands of Gullah Geechee families. Hilton Head Island is in the same county as St. Helena Island, okay. and it's the precursor to all the other destruction men along the coast, including the fact that Sea Pines, one of the first gated areas, is also down here in Florida at Amelia Island, right down from mm -hmm. this property here. Okay, so we don't work with the county on nothing to do with our land other than keep your hands off of it and don't try to use eminent domain. Uh, and we created a law in Buford County, which is a cultural protection overlay district, which covers the island I live on, St. Helena Island. It is the only zoning law I found in the world so far that is a zoning law that deals with protecting a culture and a cultural group. So that's the only way we work with the county because that was a necessary means by which to keep what we needed in place. Where all around us, they have still continued the destruction. And now the people who are already flooding on Hilton Head on a daily basis and they don't want it advertised because then the tourists won't keep coming. They are trying to look for land on higher ground in the county, but they don't want it too well known. 
So our thing is just to work with also our open land trust to make sure there aren't any properties along the coastal areas of other sacred grounds and other things available for anybody's tax roll for anybody to put up a real estate sign on, those kinds of things. But they're not our friends as far as we're concerned. These, this is just a necessary evil we have to contend with, is as she mentioned, when colonizers came, again, the second okay. trip, uh, to the Sea Islands, they put in laws, but not for us. It was for their own other people who were coming. Because we weren't doing any of that stuff that nobody needed to control. We knew how to live in balance with the land and how to own it and how to make sure that if we nurtured it, so it would nurture us. And so now most of what is being argued about in terms of necessary movement, they keep trying to talk us into moving while meanwhile you have all these resorts and all these gated places that have fallen into the ocean even with just rain incidents, not hurricanes. Why are you talking to us? That's who you need to be buying out and preventing from rebuilding. And so now they're realizing that has become what they say the difficult conversation. But it ain't difficult for you to come and ask me and my people if we should leave. You know, you're talking about people's literal blood, sweat, and tears in that soil. We're not leaving. You're talking about literal placenta in that soil. We're not leaving. That, that land, as I always tell people, the land is our family and the waterway is our bloodline. So how would you like it if I came to you and told you, can I buy your whole family? What's your price? You see, we've been there already. It was called transatlantic slave trade. So we got to look at these things through cultural lenses, and more often than not, people don't. Our culture is not a migratory culture. It is a land-based culture. So it's an insult for someone to talk to us about selling land, you see? Because you're telling us put our family on the auction block all over again. That's what you're saying. So that has been a conversation we've had to have in many arenas, in political arenas, beyond county. And so we're still trying to get people to Get that in here. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just thinking about a lot of the communities that you see in the U.S. that are attempting sort of coherent relocation mm -hmm. for an entire community. Yeah. Predominantly indigenous communities. Absolutely. Like Shimaha and Ilshan Charles, mm -hmm. you know, here in West Alaska. Mm -hmm. um, to kind of get happened in North Carolina too. Yeah, yeah. These are sort of cultures that are land-based, resource-dependent. The idea of the people is also the culture. We're not going to move too far, but like we can move as long as we move together. together. Right. And is that something, I mean, obviously, two examples I gave are places that have essentially become uninhabitable, right. hopefully. If aspects, parts of the Gullah Indian Nation get to that point where this is uninhabitable, the quality of life beyond this land is not, it's not viable, not viable mm -hmm. is that the sort of thing that your community would start considering? I think if it got to that point, they would start considering. Or before they even start considering it, they figure out how to build houseboats in that same spot. <laughs> you see what I mean? I really believe that. I don't think that any of us, given our history in this country, would trust somebody coming in and talking to us about that. Because we would know that the day that a hundred of us moved down the road, or up the road, or up the mountain, these other folks would find a way mm -hmm. to have aquatic houses in our same spot mm -hmm. and then have the audacity to put up a gate to charge people to come back in or say, well, you don't, you don't live in here, you don't have no pass, so you can't come in there. We've seen it already. So we don't intend to participate in it, okay? And I know it's hard for some people if your culture has been more migratory. You can buy a house here, you flip it. You buy one big house, you live in it 10, 20 years, then you downsize. <laughs> then you hit the lottery, y'all upsides. And then y'all get rid of your house and you own an RV and you travel your final years in the RV. We don't do that. Okay? So I get it that if your culture does it, it's hard to understand why y'all want to stay right there. That one spot, that one high. You know, but if you had been ripped literally from your motherland and had your family torn apart and cast it off places where you'll never find them again, you would understand why it's important for us to stay together. Yeah, and stay where we know that if a family member is looking for you, even if it's two generations later, they know where to come from. Mm -hmm. And you be there when they get mm -hmm. there with some cornbread cooked and some cornbread. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So it, it makes a difference. 
Um, so I get it that it's hard for people to really grasp it. And it's not that we're illogical, but we just know how to adapt. That was part of the session. And the same way our ancestors left us collective consciousness about where not to build, we tried to tell the outsiders coming in. They didn't listen. Okay? So we're tossed in the midst of all this kind of stuff in these discussions, not because of the way we were living, but because outside people brought their way of life in. Yeah, and it's not sustainable. So now hopefully with the traditional knowledge, the discussions, the tools, the things that can be translated back into the other worlds like you're asking about, they'll take it and start to take in some of what we're talking about and change jurisdictional lines on the coast, change what materials we use to build on the coast, change how we're building on the coast, and still keep families together. You see, there's a way, it's not what you do, how you do it. And once you make that a priority, all different other kinds of policy initiatives become mm -hmm. possible. Like yes. in Turkey Creek after Hurricane Katrina, they were like, look, stop giving storm, stop giving wetland mitigation credits outside of this particular wetland. Mm -hmm. Because if you're gonna keep paving it over, then we're gonna keep flooding. Yes. If we're not we're then we're not leaving. Right. And so all of a sudden, it was like, oh, wait, there's all kinds of creative solutions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're not going to leave, then let's talk. So I think that, that yeah. sense of like, wait a minute, let's work really hard yeah. to make sure that you're trying everything else you can before this place gets uninhabitable. Right. And, it's, and, and maybe that Walmart parking lot should go. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and maybe knock down a few hotels <laughs> and all that and pile that land back up that to, for food instead of golf. Those kind of things, yeah. Any other questions? Well, I did point this out during our, our discussion. I want to do it again because I know some other people weren't here at that time. Um, a lot of the questions you may have that might even be burning or if you're, like Kate telling me, tells me all the time, I'm processing, right? <laughs> you're still processing. Um, we be Gullah Geechee, all the books that I have up here are for sale. And that this will help you really understand and you'll be happy to know uh, one of my current students out of Florida has been researching how much research has been done on Gullah Geechee people. <laughs> All right. And so he pointed out how people are amazed in academia by this book because they said they have not found where another indigenous group of people have created their own guide to how to research them. Okay. <laughs> But this is essentially what this is. What to do and what not to do coming into our coastline. But it is something that can be modeled in other communities. Like she mentioned Turkey Creek. And you mentioned some great ones down in the Gulf and things like that. That can be modeled that are things that you might want to know that would either help you work with the community or get you kicked out. <laughs> like if you don't listen. Uh, that kind of thing. You not get as much information as you might have desired as a researcher or policy maker or planner and others. But there are a lot of things in here that I've gotten some really great feedback from people in an array of positions in the world who have said this is a great book, you know, because this has helped me really understand the communities that I want to work in, or I am working in, and the cultural differences we have, but how we can still <coughs> collaborate. And so we definitely appreciate all of you who took the time out to choose this session, because you could have gone to one of the others as well. So as we often say, down, down on the course, we say, you taught it not robbery, but come join me this evening thing like that. So we're so happy that you did and that you took part in being part of the circle. Our circle is always broadening. We are on social media. <laughs> we are Gullah Geechee Nation on Facebook. We're at Gullah Geechee on Twitter. If you can't spell Gullah Geechee, there you go. There's no I in Geechee. If it a we, there's no I in Geechee. So you can follow us also on Instagram at Gullah Geechee. We post things constantly on there. If you follow GullahGeecheeNation.com, you will find Gullah Geechee TV on there, Gullah Geechee Rhythm Radio. There are a number of resources on there that you know would be accurate about our community. And we also post things from our Gullah Geechee Sustainability Think Tank, which both of them are part of, um, that help to share the knowledge across different fields, really in an interdisciplinary fashion, but also as a resource back to the community. So all those little arrows that you saw, right, are, are 
the flow of discussions that it goes from us to places it comes back to us and we take and send it back. So it is not this linear thing. So that's why we threw your day off just a little, making you get in the circle. That's because that is a tradition for our community, to sit in the circle and then share. Because you can see who you're talking to, but hopefully you can feel them as well. And you know that whatever energy you put out in the circle, what did we say happened? Come right back. Come back around. So we pray that we've given you not only some positive energy, but some enlightening energy that Hunter Chilling can use wherever Hunter to be from and take like a better. And as we always say, Hunter must take care of the roof and heal the tree. So we pray that we give you some tools to dig a little deeper in all your communities and help them become more resilient and adapt to the changing climate of those minds that we're going to clear so we get more open hearts that want to be in the circle together. Peace and blessings. Thank you. Guys.